Hey, biology class. So chapter 19 is a chapter that I often don't even make the effort to get to in Gen Bio, uh, Bio 111. I talk a lot about viruses when I teach microbiology, so that's Bio 204. But I figured given the current circumstances that viruses might be something that you want to know more about. So it seemed appropriate this semester. Um, and so we're going to go ahead and dive in. Now, one of the things with viruses is there's a little bit of a debate going on, like how do we talk about viruses? What do, what do we, are they living or are they not living? Like what are these things that cause disease and cause suffering and, and all these things? And so really there's kind of these two different camps where some scientists would argue, okay, if you think back to chapter one in our textbook even, it talks about what life is. And we had all these different properties like uh, displaying order and metabolizing, reproducing, evolving, you know, all these different properties of life. But viruses, so viruses reproduce, but they can't do it on their own, right? They're actually utilizing a host cell to do that. And so, and they don't really metabolize for themselves. They let the host cell do that. So they don't really exhibit these properties. And so that group of scientists would say, they're just infectious molecules. Okay, that's one way to look at it. And then other scientists might say, well, yeah, but they direct cells. So there's some really interesting um, examples of how viruses can change their host. They change the DNA of their host. If you actually look at the human genome, large portions of it seem to be viral in origin, right? Things that kind of got dropped off and left behind. And so they're directing cells, maybe even directing the evolution of life. It's, they're more than just this inert, lifeless molecule, right? Like, so you have some people being like, nope, they're an infectious molecule. They're not living. And other people being like, yeah, but this is kind of weird if you think about how they're directing life, right? They're more. Um, so what we'll do <laughs> is kind of ride the fence on this one. So I would say most scientists would agree that they're not living. They don't truly exhibit um, those properties of life, but they're more than an inert like lifeless molecules. So um, most scientists kind of ride the fence on this one. So here's a definition for you, right? They're infectious particles, which are obligate intracellular parasites. Now, if you break that down, obligate intracellular parasite, a parasite has to live in or on a host. In this case, since we're talking about intracellular, that would be within a cell. So they live inside cells and they're obligated to, they have to be inside of a, um, of a host cell, right? So um, we'll go with that as our definition, right? How's that for riding the fence? Okay, so something else I wanted to point out is how tiny these guys are. So what this picture is showing you, and I stole this from my micro textbook, this is this blue cell is a yeast cell, so a eukaryotic cell. It would have a nucleus, organelles, all that. Here are two examples of bacterial cells, very microscopic. If you go up to a thousand times magnification on our microscopes, they look like little dots and rods, like they're tiny. And then the rest of what's on here um, basically are viral viruses. I was gonna say cells, they're not cells, right? Um, so 10 is a hemoglobin molecule, so that's a protein. So if that gives you any kind of indication, how teeny tiny, what's this one, um, yellow fever is. Here's a number four is HIV, right? Relatively large in the scale of viruses, but tiny, right? These measurements are all in nanometers. So you think about how much death, illness, economic destruction HIV has inflicted, and it's tiny, right? I mean, you could fit hundreds, thousands of those, probably 10,000, in a human cell. So they're tiny. Okay, they're also not very complicated. So a virus basically has an outer covering and a central core. In that central core, we have to have some kind of genetic material, okay? So nucleic acids, DNA or RNA. Now viruses are strange in for many ways. They can carry double-stranded DNA. They can carry single-stranded DNA. 
Didn't know that was a thing, did we? Um, they can also have single-stranded RNA, which is what we're kind of used to. Um, we were looking at messenger RNA, but they can also have double-stranded RNA. Didn't know that was a thing either, right? So viruses carry genetic information, but they don't carry a lot. So for example, again, we said humans have something like 20,000 genes. That E. coli bacteria I just showed you has about 2,000 genes. HIV? Any guesses? Nine. Nine genes. So it really only carries genes for things it absolutely needs. Everything else it's going to let the host cell take care of. Okay. Um, some viruses also in that central core will have um, some different proteins that, that they take with them, enzymes. So for example, not all viruses would need enzymes, but HIV, again, is a good example. It actually has an enzyme called reverse transcriptase because HIV is an RNA virus. It needs the enzyme reverse transcriptase for when it enters a human cell, it's gonna take that RNA and, and convert it back into DNA which our cells will then use. So that would be an example of a virus that needs to have um, an enzyme. Okay, but that's really, that's all that's inside. The outer covering is always made up of a capsid. And a capsid, it's, there's a series of protein called capsimeres, these little proteins that all hook together to make this outer shell around the virus, right? So that's what we're showing kind of here, this outer shell. And then some viruses, not all, but some will have this outer, um, called an envelope, right? It's a, it's a piece of membrane. Notice the phospholipid bilayer. It's a piece of membrane that's actually been stolen from the host cell, either from the cell membrane, um, maybe even like the Golgi apparatus or the endoplasm reticulum, any part of that endomembrane system. So it's stealing this membrane. And it's actually kind of clever because if you steal a child, right? So you're like budding out of a cell and you grab a little layer of that membrane on the way out, you're so hidden from the immune system, right? It's your little invisibility cloak um, that you take with you. And so we would call viruses that have an envelope enveloped viruses. Um, and those without are often referred to as naked viruses. Okay. So here's a maybe a better picture if you're having trouble picturing that capsid, that outer coat. It's made up of individual proteins called capsimeres. Um, and they are, they're showing you a couple of the main uh, shapes here. Where is my pointer? Let's do that, right? Um, this one's called an icosahedral, kind of looks like the Epcot Center. Um, this one over here is crazy. We'll talk a little bit more towards the end of class about bacteriophages. Um, these are viruses that only affect bacteria, um, but they really, they look like these little lunar landers. Um, it's kind of crazy. Okay. So then one of the key things I think to understand um, about viruses is how they go about reproducing. So what's going to happen here? is a virus is gonna gain entry into a host cell. And it really can do this two ways. It either needs to attach to the surface of the cell to a receptor and then get allowed into the cell, or it needs the host cell to actually do endocytosis, right? To engulf it and bring it in. So <clears throat> when a virus attaches to the host cell, it uses a protein on the viral surface called a spike. And these spikes, these little proteins, are what then is able to, to dock, to fit on a receptor on the host cell. So for example, if you've heard swine flu, right, it's called H1N1. Or if you go get your flu vaccine, they'll tell you which, you know, it's H3N2 is the, the strain we're giving you this year. Those H1N1, H is a specific spike called the hemagglutinin spike and that is H1, right? That's going to be a totally different virus than flu that's H3, right? It has a different spike. So um, we use those spikes some for the naming of viruses, but the virus uses them to gain entry into the cell, right? And to find an appropriate host cell. So when you think about like what cell a virus wants to infect, 
right? Realize we have what's called the host cell range, right? What cells could this virus potentially infect? And so this can go either based off of cell type or by species. So if you think about a virus like rabies, rabies infects the nervous system. It's infecting the brain and different neurons. And so it's only finding the receptor that it needs on neurons, right? It doesn't attack your liver or your skin. Just the, the neurons have the correct receptor. But many mammals have that receptor on their neurons. So it's not just humans that get rabies, but raccoons and bats, and don't forget about old yeller, dogs, <clears throat> right? They have a similar receptor on their neurons, and so the virus can infect any of those. So that's what we would mean by host cell range. Um, and that's a little different than say like HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, it infects T cells, right? It's only helper T cells, white blood cells in our bodies that have the correct receptor and no other species has that receptor. So for example, in um, the apes, they get SIV, simian immunodeficiency virus. And there's actually a cat version, feline immunodeficiency virus, but it's different viruses. Their range does not include us, for example, for feline immunodeficiency virus, okay? So those spikes make a big difference um, and the receptors on the host cell make a big difference. Okay, so then <clears throat> once that virus manages to get inside of the cell, it's going to end up basically unwrapping itself and spilling its nucleic acid out. So in this case, we have a DNA virus. Now, this genetic material, I don't know what it says, the virus is essentially wanting to take over the host cell, right? Make it the host do everything for it. I need you to make the proteins. I need you to make more copies of my nucleic acids. So it gets the host cell to do DNA replication, but of the virus, right? And it gets the host cell to actually look at this DNA, do transcription, make messenger RNA, and then have the ribosomes actually do translation, build those proteins, right? And so what we end up with are all the proteins, all the nucleic acids, all the parts of thousands of new viruses, um, and then they will assemble into the next, brand, next round of virus, and then they need to leave the cell, right? So often when they're leaving the cell, either there's so many of them in there that they just cause the whole cell to burst and they go pouring out, or um, if you're an enveloped virus, when you get ready to leave, you're gonna start pinching off little chunks of the cell membrane, to take as your little invisibility cloak, and that'll eventually destroy the host cell as well. All right, so that's basically what viral replication looks like. The thing to keep in mind is one virus might enter this cell, and this cell might make 10,000 copies of that virus. So um, if this is COVID-19, for example, you got one virus into a respiratory, into a lung cell, right? Um, and you might get 10,000 out. They're now seeking their own host cell. They're looking for that same receptor um, in other parts of your lungs. So viruses um, can increase their numbers pretty dramatically using this really sneaky technique taken over, taken over the cell. Okay, I did want to show you this one too because this is, um, I mentioned um, how HIV works. So notice here, this is a nice look at um, HIV is an enveloped um, virus, and so it actually kind of fuses back into the host cell. That's how it gets taken in. But notice that it does the same thing, right? It dumps um, its RNA, in this case, into the host cell. And notice those little green dots. It's brought with it. There's that reverse transcriptase I mentioned. So the virus dumps its RNA and its enzyme, reverse transcriptase, goes ahead right, and runs transcription backwards, makes DNA, which then goes into the host cell nucleus, and the host cell is like, oh, I should work with this DNA. And so then the same idea, it's going to go ahead and do replication, making copies of the RNA for the new virus and um, messenger RNA, which then gets converted to proteins. And we make new copies, um, and out goes the HIV 
And this is kind of cool too. So notice um, the spikes that need to be on the outside of the virus. The host cell, when it makes those proteins, actually transports them to the cell membrane, embeds them in the cell membrane, so they're just ready to go for the virus when it's leaving. This is wild, and this is why people are like, okay, okay, you can't, I'm okay, so they're not living, but you can't just call these like inert molecules. They are doing stuff. Okay. Um, this is the bacteriophage, sometimes just called phages or a phage. Um, these are going to be viruses, and this is an actual microscopic image of one. These are viruses of bacteria. They do not infect animal cells, plant cells, only bacteria. And in fact, every bacterial species that we know of has a phage that infects it. So, and again, another microscopic um, image of a bunch of these viruses um, docking on the surface of a bacterial cell. So one of the things, these are probably the viruses that we understand best. Um, they've been a model uh, organism. They've been researched. They have, um, you know, they're easy to grow in the lab, easier to grow in the lab because you just need to keep a bacterial culture instead of like human cells. Um, so we know a lot about phages. Um, one of the really interesting things that I've heard about with these guys is the potential to use them kind of like antibiotics. So instead of giving someone a drug to say kill um, an E. coli infection, what if you could give the person that phage that's gonna attack the E. coli, right? It won't infect the human cells. And so there's kind of a nifty way to get rid of um, bacteria that you don't want. Okay, so bacteria aren't super excited about these phages infecting them. And this is kind of cool. So. Notice in this image, the phage doesn't actually go into the host cell. It docks on the surface like a lunar lander, and then it puts out this hypodermic needle <laughs> and injects its DNA into the host cell. It's not really a needle, but that's what it's like. So we inject that DNA. Now, basically, um, CRISPR-Cas9, you guys um, have heard a little bit about this is how bacteria defends itself. So the way this works, right, is if, if a bacterium, you know, generations ago was infected by the same type of phage, right, the same species, um, it's going to have a little piece of that genetic code embedded in its chromosome. And so what we can do here, right, what the bacteria does is it actually makes a little, right, an RNA transcript. This is like pre-mRNA, if you remember that. Um, and so it's processed some. Basically, it's, it's trimmed up a little bit. Um, and it binds to a protein called Cas9. So CRISPR itself, um, what does that stand for? It's, a, it's an acronym, Clustered Regularly Interspaced Palindromic Repeats. So right, CRISPR. Um, it's basically the palindromic repeats. A palindrome reads the same either direction, repeat. So it's describing kind of this chunk of, of viral um, DNA. Cas9, or Cas, is the protein that basically holds that little um, messenger RNA. So what then is going to take place um, is that CRISPR-Cas9 duo roam around inside of the bacterial cell and basically check um, the DNA. And so if it finds that DNA from a new phage, right, that's trying to, to parasitize it, trying to take over, the, the Cas9, the Cas is an enzyme, and it's basically able to cut this invading um, DNA right, this viral uh, DNA, and so it can avoid being taken over and used um, for the devices of that phage. So this is pretty slick. Um, okay, so knowing a little bit about viruses, I think one thing that's important and particularly pertinent here in 2020 is this idea of emerging viruses, right? And in micro, I talk about it a little more broadly as emerging infectious disease, but absolutely a large chunk of those um, are viruses. And so you've probably heard of Ebola. There have been a couple outbreaks in Africa, and we have had a couple cases that made it here in the U.S., um, but didn't really spread, right? 
Um, this is a, a virus um, in South America. Zika is another emerging infectious disease you've probably heard about. Um, it's the one it gives babies microcephaly, so with tiny heads. So moms who are pregnant and infected with Zika virus, it causes really um, profound birth defects in their young. Um, that's been really problematic down in Brazil. A few cases um, in the southern U.S. because it's carried by mosquitoes. So the thing with emerging diseases is they just keep coming, right? There are going to be new diseases all the time. And some of the things that we're doing right now are actually encouraging um, new viruses to come about. So one of the things to think about is how climate change might be changing um, the presence of diseases in certain areas. So basically, as North America warms, we see um, this is VBD, that's vector-borne disease, basically diseases that are transmitted um, by insects like ticks or mosquitoes. Those insects typically have been kept, you know, in, in, at southern elevations or equatorial um, or subtropical areas. Um, but as the northern latitudes, or I suppose in the southern hemisphere, the very southern latitudes are warming, those vectors, those insects can live um, in new environments. And so that's a big concern, right? How those diseases might spread in a warmer climate. Um, another thing that we really think about, um, and this is less about climate change, but more about globalization, is the idea that we're, we're moving um, vectors around, right? Insects get moved. Um, and we're also moving pathogens, and we clearly see that in COVID-19, um, the ability of people just to, to fly around the world allowed that virus to spread really rapidly. So um, other things to keep in mind would be things like um, a lot of, it's something like 70% of these emerging infectious diseases are actually zoonotic. They come from animals. So even, you know, it's not quite decided yet with coronavirus, but there's a lot of indication that this came from bats. Um, Ebola looks like it had um, lived in bats and was able to jump um, to humans. So a lot of these viruses that are infecting us, new viruses that we're finding, um, have been living in animals. And so we need to be really careful with how we treat the environment. So um, building a new road into the rainforest to, to log a new section of, of old growth forest puts humans in contact with these vectors, with these animals and potentially these viruses. And once they've made that jump to humans, right? And it's not always that easy, but if it does happen, um, globalization has set us up for those to spread really rapidly. So, um, we definitely have a role to play in how these diseases um, are emerging. Last thing I'll say, and then I will let you go, get yourself out of the way there, um, is about prions. So prions are, it's kind of a, a contraction word for proteonaceous infectious proteins. So prions, this is a funky thing. So um, this is trying to show you what a, a tertiary structure of a protein should look like, right? There's, um, uh, right, you had a long polypeptide chain, it started folding. So they're trying to show you the, the alpha helix, the beta pleated sheet portions, and how they fold. A prion is simply a misfolded protein that causes disease. So this is strange. Talk about um, this isn't living, it's a protein, okay? It's just not folded right. But this has led to some crazy diseases. So if you think about um, mad cow disease, mad cow disease is caused by a pre prion. Technically, it's called bovine spongiform encephalopathy, which is a fancy way to say that it turns a brain into a sponge, right? So we have all these extra um, holes in here. Um, this does spread to humans. When it's in a human, we, we tend to call it Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, but it does the same thing to the human brain. So there was an outbreak of mad cow disease in the, I want to say the 80s in Great Britain. And if you lived there during that time, you're actually not allowed to donate blood to this day um, because this could also pass through blood transfusion. Um, but it has killed, I want to say it was less than 200. It was over 100. Um, people from eating this tainted meat 
And the idea, what we think is happening with these prions is that if you consume a prion or you have a prion present, that it kind of scoots up next to a normally shaped protein and, and teaches it how to misfold. And so things like mad cow disease, um, you have this buildup of these proteins that forms like a plaque that then damages the brain and creates these holes. Lots of other, I will say this before I scare you, these diseases are not super prevalent and they generally can be avoided by avoiding cannibalism. So there is a form of a prion disease in Papua New Guinea called Kuru, and it was found in a tribe who practiced cannibalism. I, I don't know the details, but something like, you know, eating the brain of your ancestor helps pass them on, that sort of thing. Um, and they developed these prion diseases. There is um, chronic wasting disease in deer and elk. Best we can tell that doesn't really pass to humans, but mad cow disease was completely avoidable. We were feeding ground up cow brains to cows. First of all, cows are herbivores, right? They don't eat animals and they certainly don't eat other cows. Um, and so this was a, a mistake on our part, for sure, um, that kind of let that prion get a foothold. So um, that's an interesting one. If you want to learn more about viruses and prions, um, take microbiology next semester, and we will go into great detail. But I did want to make sure um, that we had a little primer on viruses. And on Thursday, um, let's talk more. It is Thursday, Wednesday. Sorry, you guys are Wednesday. In class, let's talk more about um, COVID-19. See what you guys um, know, what you've been hearing. Um, I'll do my best to share kind of the current research with you guys, and we'll go from there.